Right, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I thought it was wonderful watching the way that they put this room back together. It was agile project management at its best. And you notice that they made use of a very specific tool called a hammer in the end, which I thought was great. So, let's uh, talk about the biggest problem we have on all projects, which is communication. We're very, I'm an engineer, I've been trained classically, you think logic, you say something to someone, you give them some data, and you think they're going to understand, but they just fail to understand the situation. So let's look at a situation in NASA um, where communication unfortunately broke down. 16 minutes from safety, the Space Shuttle Columbia breaks up as it re-enters the atmosphere. There was no chance of survival for the seven astronauts on board as the NASA shuttle fell apart 65 kilometers above Earth. Mission Control in Houston had been tracking the craft as it flew over the southern United States. Control in Houston, flight controllers and Mission Control continue through Space Shuttle contingency procedures. The shuttle was just over a quarter of an hour from landing at Cape Canaveral in Florida when some of the key data indicators failed. Moments later, scientists on the ground lost all contact. Live television pictures showed several white streaks apparently flaming across a blue sky. Okay, tragic pictures. Seven people died. It was completely and totally unnecessary. NASA knew that that spacecraft had severe problems 10 days beforehand, and they could have put it right, as people could now be alive. But NASA failed to do so. Now, before we go any further, we do need to talk about NASA. Um, are NASA stupid? No. Uh, you have to have a PhD to clean the toilets uh, in NASA. Um, how about procedures and methodologies? Well, they have some of the best in the world, so that's not an excuse. Um, perhaps it's um, they haven't got good communications. Well, they had video conferencing between all of their centers 40 years ago. Okay, well, are they psychopaths? Did they want people to die? No, they didn't. NASA are very, very good people. And when I interview them about this case, they still get very emotional. So you've got good people, Engineers, technologists, programmers, the best in the world with the best protocols, the best procedures, um, the best of everything. And yet, unfortunately, these seven people died because NASA failed to communicate. And this isn't the first time that NASA had failed to do it. They'd actually killed seven people 17 years before for exactly the same reason. If we go back to 1986, now I know some of you probably weren't even born, so I feel very old at this stage, but in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded on takeoff. Uh, most of you have seen that, presumably on TV or whatever. Uh, they actually knew four hours before they launched that craft, again, that everyone would die on the mission. But they went ahead, because people like us, very intelligent, logical, data-driven people, failed to communicate to their management, to their clients. If you don't believe me, let's hear from the guy who actually designed the component that actually failed on the spacecraft and killed, <laughs> killed the seven astronauts. It's a guy called Roger Beaujolais. He's an engineer. Uh, this is him interviewed about five years ago. If I were to uh, go through the list of the astronauts who are on board, I probably would crack my voice and tears would form again. And, yeah, I do get very emotional because of the fact that human lives were lost needlessly. Because I never considered it an accident, and I will never consider it an accident. It was predetermined what would happen, and people just did not listen. Okay, as you can see, still very emotional about an accident that occurred um, uh, many years ago. So, let's go back to Challenger. Yes, Challenger exploded, so we remember it for that reason. But in fact, at the time, it was the most important shuttle flight they'd ever done, except the first one, obviously. The reason being, it had a very special passenger on board. Can anyone remember why it was special? Who was the special passenger? School teacher, well done. Uh, a lady called, do you happen to know? Krista McAuliffe, an ordinary high school teacher, an untrained astronaut. What on earth was she doing on board this vehicle? Well, the answer is politics. The then President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, decided that he wanted to look as if he was pro-education. So he came up with this crazy idea, let's put a teacher on a spaceship. NASA said no. 
He then explained, excuse me, NASA, who pays your salaries? And they went, you do, sir. In that case, it's a great idea. So straight away, we've got a project that is perverted by politics. Now, NASA then thought about this and said, we can make this look good, because this particular flight is the most important. Why? It's the 25th flight. Now, when Congress had originally given them money for the shuttle, they said, NASA, it's an experimental vehicle. If you can fly it 25 times without incident, then it will no longer be an experiment, it will be an operational vehicle. And as a result, your funding will increase. So what better way to show that they were really good than to put an untrained person on this bus into space? So there's a lot of hype about the reliability of the shuttle on this mission, and unfortunately, it was the mission that failed. Now, another unfortunate consequence is that lots of school children in America were watching this launch live in their classrooms that morning to watch their teacher go into space. And uh, it's had a major effect on that generation of Americans. Uh, I know this, I did a lecture about six years ago, and a lady in the front started crying. Now, my lecturing can be bad, but even so. And I, and I said, what is the matter? And she stood up and she said, I wish to testify in an American accent. And I said, I can see you're American. She said, I was actually in Krista McAuliffe's flight. I will now tell you about what happened in that classroom that morning, watching my teacher die live in the classroom. And the tears were just streaming down her face. And she said, as a result, I have no belief in government and no belief in management. And I haven't for the rest of my life. Because, as it turned out, they knew that Krista McAuliffe was going to die. So, let's go back to 1969. Okay, so first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. And the most important deliverable on that project, probably down at level of 150 on the work breakdown structure, what do you think was the most important thing that they had to deliver on that project? Led by the USSR. And the USSR were winning. First satellite in space was from the USSR. It was a communist satellite. First dog in space was a communist. Uh, first man in space was a communist. First woman in space was a communist. First spacewalk was done by a communist. The first mating of two ships uh, in space was done by communists. So you can imagine JFK, the then president, um, saying, OK, we're going to beat those Ruskies to the moon by the end of the decade. So, uh, so straight away, a project is born. NASA said to JFK, if you want this to happen, you'll have to give us lots and lots of cash because you've time limited this project. It is, it is agile by definition. It has to be delivered by the last uh, day of the decade. Otherwise, the communists win. And they did it, and it's quite a fantastic project to have done. It was very agile, although they didn't actually call it that in those days. Apollo 12. Does anyone know the names of the astronauts on Apollo 12? Probably the most understand. So you've got to make sure that you understand your client understands just how difficult it is to work under agile conditions. Now, we all remember Apollo 13. Why? Well, Tom Hanks was on board, and we had to get him back. He's a good actor. Last mission on the moon was Apollo 17. There should have been an Apollo 18, but by this stage, the American public were bored, 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 bored. Unfortunately, by that stage, there were 400,000 people working on the space program in America. And if you're going to cancel missions, that means you could have 400,000 people without jobs. So Congress said, come up with a new mission said, well, I guess we could go to Mars. But the problem about going to Mars is if you build a spaceship big enough to go to Mars and fill it with fuel, at the time, it wouldn't take off from the surface of planet Earth. So the only answer is to build a spaceship in space. And to do that, you then need a space station. And to build the space station, you then need a truck. And that's what the space shuttle was originally called by NASA, truck. It would deliver men and materials up into space to build the space station uh, and deliver men and materials to the space station and fuel to then build a rocket to go to Mars. 
It went in front of Congress, and Congress said it's far too expensive. And NASA said, well, that's what it costs. And this is where the accountants got involved. Have you ever had to deal with accountants? Marvelous people. OK. The accountants said, we can do it for a lot less money. And the engineers said, no, you can't. And they said, we're accountants. Of course we can. We can do it for half the money. And the engineers said, you are not engineers. You don't understand. They said, no, we're accountants, and we run the world. Now, what we'll do uh, is we will build the rocket ship to go to Mars much, much later. We're building the future. Uh, the space station, we won't build it now. We'll build it in the future. Um, and the further you build things in the future, on paper, using a technique called net present value um, calculations, oh, some of you are familiar with them, well done, it makes the capital expenditure go down. If you don't understand what I've just said, it'll only take you 15 minutes to work it out. It's very basic maths. Um, and basically, what they said is we'll lose the spaceship, we'll do that in 20, 30 years' time. We'll do a space station, we'll do that in 1990. We like the shuttle, that's good. And we can keep 400,000 people employed. NASA came up with a very good question. What is the a point of building a space truck that's got nowhere to go and nothing to do for 10 years? Now, that is an excellent question. The answer is it keeps 400,000 people employed, but that's embarrassing to the politicians. So they said, well, what, what else could we do with a truck? And someone said, well, I suppose we could launch satellites. And the engineer said, stop right there. We can put satellites up on unmanned vehicles for a third of the cost. And the accountant said, well, that's easy. All you have to do is put three times the number of satellites into the space truck. And the engineer said, you can't just triple the payload. And they said, well, that's an engineering problem. Deal with it. Now, uh, it's, it's still not going to make money. How, how, how many are you going to launch a year? And they said, this is the most complex machine mankind has ever conceived. Um, five launches a year? And the accountant sat down on the spreadsheet and said, no, it doesn't make money. And the engineer said, well, that's not our problem. They said, it has to make money. Double the launch rate. The engineer said, you can't just double the launch rate. They said, engineering problem, deal with it. Actually, it doesn't work at 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Break even at 25. What we want this to do is to actually deliver three satellites per launch, or one big Star Wars satellite, and we want it to actually launch uh, 25 times in a year. Uh, and the engineer said, you are absolutely mad. And the accountant said, yes, but who runs the world? Good. So... The shuttle was going to go ahead, this much, much bigger space truck. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the, uh, the, the shuttle and the weight, on takeoff, it weighs three times the weight of the Statue of Liberty in New York. And what they asked the engineers to do was to build an engine to throw three Statue of Liberties from Earth 100 miles vertically straight up into space against gravity and accelerate them from zero to 17 and a half thousand miles an hour and do that in eight minutes. Is that a big engine? One of the biggest engines mankind has ever conceived. So they went to the rocket scientists in NASA. Now, I'm going to talk about four centers of NASA. This is a simplified story, though I'm other centers of NASA. Let's talk about four. You know them by their place names. So shout out a place name that you associate with NASA. Houston. Who said Houston? Houston. Marvelous. Well done. And um, what do they do in Houston? What do they do in Houston? It's mission control. Okay. Why is it in Houston? Nothing to do with technology, I'm afraid, or logic, or data. Uh, it's called the Johnson Space Flight Center. Uh, President Johnson came from Texas, and if you have a big space center in Texas, it means lots of jobs, and lots of jobs means lots of votes, and votes equals power. Okay, so you're dealing with politics again. Another place that you associate with NASA. Cape Canaveral, well done. And there, obviously, they take off. They can land shuttles there. They don't like to land there because it's quite a short runway. They prefer to land them at Edwards Air Force Base and fly them back on the back of a 747. But the accountants don't like that because it's expensive. Where are you going to have your head office if you're NASA? Washington, because that's where all the politicians are, and you need the politicians to give you the money. So does anyone know where the fourth center is, where all the clever engineers are, the space rocket engineers? It's actually called the Marshall Space Flight Center, and I'd never heard of it either. And it's in a place called Huntsville, in a state called Alabama. Now, why have you never heard of it? Well, it's a bit embarrassing. 
because we all assumed that the father of the American space program was JFK. Uh, but in fact, it was not. The real father of the American space program was this guy with the red arrow uh, speaking to Walt Disney, who was about to make a movie. Uh,